All right, thank you for coming to this uh, annual ops series. And I'm really glad to be kicking off with the first uh, that conversation here. And I think I've, some of you look familiar. Uh, early in the morning, I covered the business aspect of the model risk assessment and model governance. In the uh, panel session earlier this morning. So for this session, I'll mostly cover the technical aspect, you know, per se, the data science aspect of how we did it. So uh, for questions around some of the business aspect in terms of, you know, kind of the model governance processes, I'll cover just a little bit. If you have more questions about that, we can cover those in a like Q&A session or even, you know, just hit me up afterwards. Okay. All right, just a little trivia here. Um, to thank my dog name Supermodel. I guess as the model developer, you have maybe you know one privilege that's to name your model sometimes. And uh, so we were having fun with that since we use this model to supervise other models in terms of risk posture, I said, okay, why don't we call it supermodel? All right, so we'll be coming up in just a minute. So I'm guessing a lot of folks are interested in or concerned about model governance and model risk management, right? Because I just had a conversation with my Uber driver last night, right? And he was really reading up on AI and concerned about uh, Kind of AI running, kind of just run away, right? So I guess in this day and age, everybody is kind of knowing about what AI can do, or from a science fiction perspective, what it could do. Sure. Sorry. So from that perspective, especially for me. Um, so I have seen a lot of this work industry. happening. I'm very excited. I think the next step then is how do we get people to understand it? So some of these things in action, I'll just talk a bit about. So we talked about, um, I, I sort of have a passion for pregnancy care, but this is just an example that I think would be useful for us. This is an app that allows moms to track and share her pregnancy journey, right, with family and professionals. Um, what's interesting is that it also, the algorithm sends out information to the right clinician. There's a clinician workforce and a dashboard, but it also has the ability for patients to be able to track and input symptoms in real time. Pregnancy is pretty important. There's some things that are really important in healthcare in real time, others are not. Chronic care you sort of manage, but if you're trying to reduce cost, so where I come from, Anthem, we want to be able to reduce the medical cost of a patient over time, we either early diagnose, but then we need to be able to learn how to treat. So if we diagnose, let's say, kidney disease, we want to be able to say, what's the next step? Um, there's a lot of AI work right now also in kidney injury. Acute kidney injury is something that's very common, but it's underdiagnosed and leads to a lot of healthcare costs. So uh, Deep Minds and a few of the other companies working with the Veterans Affairs have started looking at this. Um, for pregnancy, you know, a simple tool to incorporate AI into women's healthcare and addressing maternal gaps is really important. Where the patient is reporting her symptoms, the symptoms get aggregated into a way where you can say, this is not that interesting, or it's not as, you know, there's no red flags, but this may be. Lack of movement or other things would be more important. So it can become smart, and the machine learning algorithm can start to figure out what are outcomes and how you drive towards better outcomes. Another thing is A15 platform. Um, I come from Anthem originally as uh, my prior work, and it's a platform designed to enable physicians and newborns and parents to share their data across ecosystems. The more we can share, the more I get excited because I think some of this information, if you have multiple capabilities from different companies, academic institutions, and researchers, you're there, then able to really dig out what is the real signal that you want to find. You almost get. Well, I'll also talk a bit about prior authorization. So in healthcare, what's a big mess of paperwork is for in our industry. Where do you, when and where do you let someone get a cancer therapy, an MRI, or when do they qualify for surgery? So a lot of AI work, even at Anthem, where I was prior, was looking at automating manual tasks. These are nurses. We have thousands of nurses that literally wait for the fax machine to come in, figure out how they come through the medical records to figure out, oh, this person had this type of, as we mentioned earlier, um, knee injury plus physical therapy plus qualified for all these things and they can check the boxes. There's two ways to do it. One 
it is like it just automatically checks the boxes and then you can go back to where it was. There's also another way where we've seen AI doesn't get us all the way there, but halfway there. So if there are five boxes to check, it checked four. That already saves the nurse a ton of time. The remaining fifth box they have to check, let's say that qualifies where they were on pain medication and didn't work. Then they can just go back to the records and look at that. So you streamline at least the first four steps. Um, this frees clinicians at both the payers and the providers to focus on complex cases and then actually elevates them, which we'll talk about helping clinicians practice at top of license. This goes back to the surgery case, it goes back to the nurses at an, um, an anthem, it goes back to a, an OBGYN doctor who's tracking a pregnancy where they don't have time to answer every call or every question of a scared mother, but they are able to at least figure out some things that are, that are more important and they can figure out what the red flags are. I will talk a bit about customization and access um, as the remaining last few moments as we're thinking about think, health disparities. Um, so one thing that we struggle with, especially in AI in healthcare, is that whenever you have the data come in, you have to make sure that the data is correct. So meaning if the last few years I prior off and allowed people of certain races, ethnicities, backgrounds to get 80% more coverage or approvals of the MRI or the surgery, then that algorithm is just going to use that pattern to generate the same type of approval. And so you can create biases. So what we've done too is instead of using that former business division um, approvals, we actually then went back and said, okay, let's compare formal approvals with existing nurses and what they would do. Um, so we tried that, and we tried to figure out at what percentage are we allowed to say, this was 99% accurate, maybe 1% discrepancy. So the algorithm turned out and said, most of people should get approved and be shipped. And so for that 1%, what does that mean? Is it enough? Is 5% enough? Is 0.1% better? So we've had to really try to figure out where the threshold is for when you compare real manual labor with what the AI algorithm can do. Um, so affordability and access is something that I think AI can help fight against. We're, I'm really excited about that. But we have to think through the medical research and just like drug discovery and other things how are we thinking about the population? Um, and last but not least, accessibility and affordability. I'll give a quick example at the end just about what I do at Everly. Um, so we want to use AI to support traditionally poor, poorly served populations to create better health outcomes. A good example is this. So Everly Health is a home diagnostic company. We work with various um, patients, payers. So we have a consumer-driven brand that does food allergies and sensitivities, but we also work with payers and Anthem, uh, United to help them close their care gaps, which we talked about earlier, which is colon, colon screens and also A1Cs, diabetes screens. Um, so it's a home test. You prick your finger and you drop some blood. Uh, what we have seen, though, is when people come in to fill out this profile, they'll say something like, I want to know my fertility journey. I want to know if I am fertile, where I am. And they take a bunch of hormone tests. But then what they fill out is actually they sometimes have some hair loss. They have a little bit of waking they're not sure about. Our AI has been able to tell us, actually, they should probably get a thyroid test. Uh, because when they're looking at this, thyroid actually affects infertility, and, and it actually can lead to worsening health outcomes. So being able to say, these are things that you should be looking out for, in addition to getting a fertility test, is what we're excited about. Um, so this creates a more customized, personalized journey, and then ultimately, if you can gear that more towards test to treat, so diagnostic-driven care, and the algorithm can help create a patient journey that's very seamless and exciting, I think that's where we're really trying to go. Um, that's my talk for today. I hope that was helpful. This was more of an overall healthcare journey discussion. Um, and I can take any questions. Speed up the model development process. Thank you so much. I did learn yeah. really thinking about data slightly differently, right? It's looking at the data that you use to build your model. All right, folks, before we proceed with our next session, data we're going to take a quick, probably a two to three minute break as we prepare data the stage for the next speakers. So if you want to just, just uh, stretch your legs, grab a so quick you water, the picture we'll start on the right in about side. three minutes with our next session, okay? Um, it will show you, you pick the few data points that are close to your decision boundary, right? You'll be able to, to build a fairly accurate model with just 
a small fraction of the data points available to you, right? So that's the rationale behind active learning. It's just not all data points are created the same, right? Some are more informative than others to help you build your models faster. The next page, please. And um, so a couple of key concepts here is, you know, I'll mention Oracle. That's just basically how the human and model will work together. So it's basically, it's once you use a few seed kind of training data points to build your initial model, which isn't very accurate, you can use that to pick the more informative data points and ask the Oracle, which is just a human in this process, right? Ask to get Oracle label back so you could train your model. The next page, please. So here we have uh, kind of step three and four, right? You can iterate that process, usually until you exhaust your time or exhaust your resources, right? Money in this case. Very rarely do you get to go through your time and resource and achieve like a, your stopping condition. So next page, please. So I have um, a quick toy example here showing how we could use active learning to identify, you know, I guess 10 times dog food. And I have a link to the actual GitHub that uh, I got from another conference. So essentially what here you pick these in terms of different dog pictures, right? And build an initial model, which isn't very accurate. Initial accuracy is only 38%, right? So you go through that iteration process with each round, you pick five more data points that are more informative and just ask Oracle or the human to say, hey, tell me which breed this is. Right, next page, please. So now after one round, you give it five more kind of annotated data points. Now you, you're better at uh, 40%. Now, next page, please. So yeah, so here after three rounds, right, we're more than 50% in terms of accuracy, right? So think about where this is a 10-way classification, right? So random guys is only 10% after only, I think in this case, 20 seeds and uh, 15 kind of Oracle samples were at 54%. So that's the kind of essence of active learning in action, right? So next page, please. So in our supermodel, so we did the same exercise. Our baseline, we compared with the traditional linear, just adding up some, I guess, magical scores for some stuff from humans, right? So we call it the linear risk scoring. Comparing that at round two for four data points each for each round, we have all performed the traditional linear-based methodology using supermodel, right? At round three, that's the uh, production run. So we're, for now, four out of four in terms of the Oracle labels, data points. And uh, I want to point out that doing Oracle labeling in this case is really expensive because you know we take a live model, we bring a panel of three SMEs to go through, really understand what this model does, how do we do let's say bias control, drift control, all these things, and determine, all right, this is high risk, this is low risk. So uh, each one for now, I think it's taken us about 10 hours to do a human label, right? So that would be the traditional process, 10 hours of risk assessment for each model. So which is you know, obviously not scalable. So next page, please. So with this process, Right, from a business outcome perspective, we were really able to enable and empower our data science teams to build their models faster right, by providing this tool to let them use it to get kind of near real-time advice and risk assessment so they know where they stand. Hey, do they need additional controls? And anecdotally, we have a few models that came in initially as high risk, and we gave them certain advice based on this tool say, hey, you need to build better bias control and better drift control. After they did that, they came back, ran the supermodel again. We were able to actually demonstrate or reduce risk levels uh, to our data science teams. 
And in terms of benefits to the enterprise model governance team, right, we were able to uh, build trust, right, sharing the explainability with our data science team to show them, okay, here's why your model were rated high, here's what you can do to reduce it. And uh, yeah, we were able to do it without uh, kind of spending thousands of hours of manual assessment time. So with that, I will, I think we still have a few minutes, really appreciate any questions. Thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of questions here. I guess we'll go uh, ahead. Great question. Yep, so that's where we took care to select the three SMEs, right, first, to make sure we have somebody who knows the risk management process, and then we also have somebody who knows the actual business problem, right, on the kind of business, the model risk side. If it's, for example, some uh, user comment filtering model, we bring somebody from the business side who knows what the impact is. So that's one aspect. And then also when picking these validation data points, right, we also took care to make sure we bring in more or less balanced data points, right? Some are high, some are low, not uh, kind of super unbalanced data points coming in. Yeah, you have a question? The model itself, it doesn't. Um, it, that's a great question. So, yeah, I'll take it back to my legal team. Yep, sure. <laughs> yeah, the methodology is, you know, active learning, that's universal, but uh, there's certain, I guess, business context we have to go through to build it. A great question. Thank you. Last name, Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. All right. Yep. Again, thank you again. If you uh, have more questions, feel free to you know find me kind of during the in the break rooms. All right. Thank you.